think that's like a million tons. Are you serious? Sorry, a lie. A thousand tons. A thousand tons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, welcome back to another episode of Global Wine News. Uh, by now, you guys probably know the drill. We're going to drill down into three or four different bits of uh, wine-related news from around the world. A um, little bit Australian-centric uh, this time. So, uh, guys, if you do actually enjoy this video or have any uh, tips, thoughts, or whatever, uh, shove it in the comments below. We're dead uh, set keen on uh, improving the channel and, uh, and making sure that we're reporting the right news for you guys and giving the right chat. First up... Uh, SA winemakers urged to export more to Japan, reported from The Advertiser. I found this really interesting because we've spoken about a little bit on the show so far uh, about the repercussions of uh, China, the tariffs placed on Australian wine. Like I said, for, for our uh, global audience, this one is a little bit Australian-centric. Um, the Japanese ambassador, like, did you guys see, like, when he came out uh, and... No, 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 I didn't. There's, there's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about this, actually. No. So he came out and he was like, guys, just send it all to Japan. We want it. We're, like, so thirsty. He's actually quite a saying, the time is high for South Australia to diversify our export destinations from uh, Mr. Yamagami. Um, Japanese people drink wine like whales, is his exact words. Consumption is enormous. Maybe you shouldn't say whales. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Uh, <laughs> not touching that with a 10 foot pole, mate. <laughs> as much as I love being able to have a nice glass of Jacob's Creek in Tokyo, what I'd really like uh, is to be able to enjoy the full range of SA wines from a fancy Penfolds to a Berry Estates fruity Lexia. Hell yeah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Yamagami is a man up to my own heart. <laughs> he gets it. He gets, he gets it. it. He's figured out SA wine pretty well. But weren't, weren't we like exporting a lot of like of these young, small, up and coming for producers to Japan over the, like a few years ago? Like over the last five or so years, there was a massive like natural wine boom from Australian producers over there, right? And, massive. And it slowed down a lot. Well, I think global, globally things have slowed down a little bit. And I think there's maybe a little bit of background uh, as to why it slowed down specifically in Japan. But Henry, did yeah. you know that there was a massive love affinity for natural wine in Japan? No, 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 I, no well, I didn't. This is interesting. So uh, I, I didn't realize how it came about until uh, we'd visited there and we chatted about it uh, with some of the locals. But basically a couple of global events uh, happened. Uh, one was the, um, uh, I believe it was like the, one of the meltdowns. Uh, there was the nuclear meltdown and there was also the, the tidal wave um, whole tsunami uh, dealio. And what that meant was there was basically rolling blackouts across all of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, that also meant that... Um, uh, people started to, especially with the nuclear thing, people started to really question where their food was coming from uh, and and how they were, you know, what they were putting into their bodies. Uh, so there tended to be this sort of like, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, bottle shops and wine stores weren't really commonplace in Japan about 10 years ago. Didn't know that either. So you can get it all at 7-Eleven. You had a 7-Eleven, but also, like, most people dined out. Most people just, like, there are even ca plenty of cases where there's there's apartment complexes that just simply don't have don't have a kitchen. It is so cheap and easy to eat out that you could you would just do that normally. It's more just so expensive to eat uh, to eat in to eat in and yeah. finding fresh produce. So what happened with these rolling blackouts is people were like, well, I can't I can't go out and I couldn't socialize. So they were like, hey, look, it's going to be really tough, but you know I want to be able to catch up with you. I want to you know bring you into my home and got to try to cook with what um, you know facilities that we've got. Um, but we need some wine, and they were knocking on the doors of a lot of these restaurants. Uh, saying, hey, do you mind, you know, selling us just some wine? We're going to take it home. We know we can't dine in with you because of a rolling blackout. Um, so what happened was the restaurants sort of recognised this and started opening up bottle shops. Um, it, dining at home became a thing. And when people started dining at home, they started questioning what was, they were putting in their bodies. And this whole thing coalesced with like an absolute adoration for natural wine, which really champions this idea of not adding anything in the process. It is very much plays into uh, beliefs in Shinto, whether or not that is like, the, you know, laws of purity and stuff like that, whether or not it's a, that's actually a mitigating factor. Um, but yeah, like the Japanese, like I've never seen anyone drink the Japanese before. They drink like whales, I've heard. Honest, no, mate. They they seriously, and and it's it's pretty impressive, uh, yeah. to be to be honest, um, because uh, uh, you know, in contrary to a lot of Australian things, you know, and it really starts to highlight things like issues with alcoholism and yeah. stuff like that. Like, you know, alcoholism is quite often uh, associated with things like um, uh, assault, and you know, yeah, you know, people getting punchy. But in Japan, that's not really that's not really much. It's so commonplace to see businessmen sleeping on the streets at 11 p.m. at night because they're too ashamed to go home because they're too drunk and they just got to go work the next day. Because they work like 
11 hour days, six days a week, and they're just sleeping on the sidewalks in full business clothes, briefcase next to them. I said on a previous episode, I think we were doing junk food wine pairings that I was never going to work in an office, but maybe if I move to Japan, I might be able to work in an office. That sounds <laughs> like an absolute right. lifestyle decision. Well, that's the thing. It's like, I, I think we did start to export to Japan, and then the market kind of, you know, dipped Peed away. it off. Yeah, dipped away for a bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but yeah, I think if we. Qu- start- questionable quality it was. Yeah, so. Okay. We ended up getting maybe, as a collective industry, particularly even from the artisan standpoint, we ended up maybe getting a little, and maybe the importers are a little bit at fault here as well, yeah. getting a little bit bullish with being able to send some pretty questionable quality wines from the natural yeah, so wine just scene. trying to keep up with the demand and putting out an inferior product sort of thing. Spot on. Yeah, pretty much. It's, it's a little bit like 2011 in China and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, all that where, kind of thing. You know, you have such, hey, you haven't, it's a really like out of sight, out of mind sometimes with export markets where they're just like, hey, we can send it across there and there's no repercussions. Well, there was repercussions. Sudden, suddenly the importers were kind of shafted with yeah. large quantities of inferior product mm. and that represented Australia as a whole in a really bad way. So um, I guess now it needs to be like, you know, Australian wine producers as a whole, ex, uh, importers in Japan as a whole to really just back good product from Australia rather than any particular dogma. Mm. All right, well, going from artisan to a completely opposite end of the spectrum, Sydney Morning Herald uh, did a awesome little piece recently on how Treasury Wine, so probably our, I would say a largest wine group next to or Accolade, uh, turned to gangster rapper Snoop Dogg to solve its crime. So this is in reference to 19 crimes. Have you seen this this wine brand? Yeah. No, I haven't. You've seen it? Yeah. It's, I think you would you would enjoy it. Yeah. It's. I would love to see like your take on, on 19 crimes. I'll see if I can throw up a... Um, a bit of an image for you, but basically um, there's, I believe maybe there's like 19 different wines in the lineup or something uh, akin to that. And each I'm liking one is those like prices. A, the prices are really, and, and believe it or not, um, Treasury Wine Estates actually says that this is premium pricing, which for them is, you know, the $20 range. Um, now, each of these are like meant to be a convict and having... Um, uh, done one of the 19 crimes and there's a real story about it but Hang it's on. really interesting this is completely like down a different path of terroir this is a constructed narrative to sell wine uh, terroir being for Noah obviously <laughs> sense of place well guessed <laughs> <laughs> absolutely correct Noah well done oh my but believe it or not, this has been outrageously popular, uh, like so so much so. But I love this talking about because I mean we're all familiar with Snoop Dogg, right? So John Wardley, you know, this is the Treasury USA head of marketing. Uh, his manager assured me right from the start that he may not turn up on time, but when he does turn up, he nails it. Um, an absolute professional, um, and obviously getting into bed with with Treasury must have been really odd. Um, it's become one of their most successful lines, um, and they did it to me- demystify the category just of wine in general, yeah. especially for young people. Love that. Um, they were meant to do 125,000 cases in their first 12 months. So that, for the winemakers and wine nerds amongst us, I think that's like a million tonnes. Are you serious? Sorry. A lie. A thousand tons. A thousand tons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 but they hit 800,000 cases instead. It was a run, it's been a runaway success. It's been a runaway success. Um, how do we feel about like these constructed narratives? We've seen this before in the beer industry. We reference the beer industry because I think it's a little bit more progressive uh, in many cases than the wine industry. Uh, James Squire is an example of this. A very similar example too. 50 Lashes and like how it's the story yeah. of convicts and whatnot. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, look, just putting Snoop Dogg on a label is a temporary solution. That is a proverbial band-aid. Mm. Don't get me wrong. Fucking love it. Really cool. Love Snoop Dogg. But how long do you reckon this is going to last down the line? Do you reckon everyone's going to be like, oh, I'm just going to keep buying the Snoop Dogg wine? That's my new favorite wine. Do you reckon Snoop Dogg drinks it himself? Do you reckon he goes home and he's like, yeah, man, gin and juice is a thing of the past. Uh, and and I'm totally going to smash, uh, you know, a bottle of Southeastern Australian Shiraz. I can't imagine Snoop Dogg saying those exact words, but I can imagine him drinking this red wine. So like, yeah, I can't I, imagine I, him being like, hey, listen, this Southeastern Australian red wine, we've really got to get around it. But I can imagine being like, hey, look at this bottle with my face on it. It's bloody tasty. I, right. I can guarantee you he's probably drank it exactly one time. On was, camera. On camera. Yep. Promotional advertising. And he's never drinking it again. <sighs> I, I, I'm pretty confident in that. Um, Nah, it, look again. Flash in the pan. Good on your, good on your treasury coming up with something a little bit innovative, but it's not going to solve your problems. Stop looking at band aids. What problem? Sorry, what problems? 
Well, I think the problem is, um, you know, a lot of the, their brands don't really resound with younger demographics. And this was sort of the case of what was happening with beer maybe about almost 20 years ago, where we had these established brands like 4X or Super Dry, um, you know, Ted's um, or like Tui's. And then the craft beer craze started to kick off and there was the sort of the, the construction of James Squire to answer this, to be able to reach new demographics, new young professionals that yep. were interested in beer. And the beers were pretty good. Like I remember going like going into a, a, a bottle shop and going, I'm gonna preference James Squires, not anything else. This is also the fact that we're in Queensland and Coopers hadn't really started selling a lot up there. Um, and so uh, now we fast forward and we just see the plethora and the growth of actual craft beer. Yep. And the, I guess the dominance of, like, if you saw James Squires, we've sort of gone to, I guess, third wave beer, haven't we? Yeah, um, big time. Well, we spoke about it a a while ago now on uh, our One News segment talking about the idea of big companies buying or mm -hmm. having their own mm -hmm. sort of uh, sub product that appears crafty, even though it's still mass produced and is essentially like a completely commercial uh, beer, but appearing to, like, appealing to that craft beer market is super... Um, Useful. So is this effectively a winemaker trying to crack into that market using Snoop Dogg just to be a bit like, I'm down with the kids? Yes. Exactly. And, and much like every marketing person for a big company like that, they did this 15 years too late. Yeah. Like when was the last great Snoop Dogg track or album or anything like that? He's the mo Is he the most relevant artist to really keep young people buying their product? Yeah, but 800,000 cases, man. Like the evidence speaks for themselves a little bit. The, the proof is in the pudding. And, it's, the pudding and it's actually true. interesting talking about like like how how long ago they probably should have enacted this. Um, yeah, there well, is... You're not, you're not, sorry, like the equivalent of Snoop, like Snoop Dogg was the biggest rapper in the world. Yeah. We're not getting into that, but like he was extremely popular at the head, mm. top of the game a long time ago. So now you've got like, you know, Kendrick Lamar, Drake, J. Cole. You're not getting one of them to come and endorse your Southeastern Australian wine. So like, I think they're just reaching for a reasonable, like someone that's accessible. You know, like Manulog got Snoop Dogg. So like, he's yeah, obviously true. out here being he's, like- He's happy to like, you know, sell his brand. Hey, you cut me a check. I'll do some stuff for you. So, you know, all power to them. I like this though. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen, uh, if you're not aware of the wine brand, then you've probably definitely not seen this, but they've, they use this new augmented reality tech. So you download this app and you flash it over the label itself and the label starts becoming basically animated. And so the, the actual convict itself suddenly becomes a legitimate like video and, and on the label as well. So you sort of start animating the, the convict itself. So we'll link, we'll link actually out in the description where you can go and watch where other people have done this. And I think they might have some stuff on their website. It's pretty cool, it's pretty interesting and it really, I guess, highlights uh, then they're really trying to go with a completely different tact when it comes to um, when it comes to actually wine marketing. So the 19 really different crimes, presumably if we're talking about convicts, something like stealing loaves of bread, Snoop Dogg, like his crime would be like possession, right? So just stealing, Surely. stealing bread. bread is <laughs> <laughs> Surely, I don't, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not aware of the crime but itself. No, he didn't get let into Australia one time because of a cannabis charge, I'm relatively sure. They should, put, they should put Johnny Depp on a label. Oh God. They <laughs> yeah, should put it. Johnny Depp on a label and like, I'm sorry, but you just can't travel into Australia sorry, with your puppies. Sorry, not it. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, moving on to this, the, I've been really looking forward to, to once okay. I found out about this, I was like, I'm, I'm into this. So this was by K Kotaku, which is actually a gaming, yep. uh, a gaming online publication. Prepare to make a lot of crappy wine in a hundred days. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a new game. Do you guys remember the farming, that farming game? Farmville. Farmville. Oh my God. Farmville. Someone's made a wine version of Farmville and it is so damn realistic. It's not funny. I, I am genuinely impressed with Rayville? this. As soon, well, as soon as I started reading this, I'm like, yeah, okay, someone's done this kind of like, you know, really shitty game. Like, this is, I think, so, it's so realistic from a winemaker's perspective that I actually was like a little bit concerned that the person who made this game, like, didn't make this as a game, but made it because they genuinely want to try to make wine in a virtual world. It's very impressive. Um, so, so someone who was like, it couldn't travel for vintage, got stuck in a particular country and couldn't make wine for nine months. <laughs> I need my fix, man. <laughs> I think this could be it because so firstly, like, and, and I got to like absolute kudos to the Kotaku like journalist who wrote this because um, they really stress tested the shit out of this game. Yeah. Um, so one of the first people you meet is the head of Harvest. He's not the chief winemaker, but he may as well be because he bluntly and immediately reminds you that you know absolutely nothing about wine and it'll probably be shit. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's from Broken Arms Games, and they've done an incredible job with this. It's a chill, low-key simulator about making wine. It's a card field game, so it's actually like almost like turn-based Tetris. Um, and it's described as being almost meditative. It's a little bit methodical, making sure your vines are treated before the winter comes, making sure you follow your asshole harvester's suggestions on sweetness, tannin, and acidity. Got a like, load of balloons <laughs> ready to hail if it comes <laughs> in. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, that's in the next update. It's the expansion pack. Oh, my uh, God. Making sure you don't fall into the trap of trying to shovel gigaliters of swill to Aldi. They actually give you an option to to choose. So it pretends it gives you, uh, you would either choose to produce low quality wine at bulk or smaller batches of high quality wine. Wow. Yeah, it gets even better. It gets even better. You start out with a single vineyard. Firstly, odd choice, Barbera grapes. Very specific. Wow. Very specific. Yeah. I mean, you could have been Pinot Noir, it could have been Chardonnay. Could have been Nebbiolo. Like, could have been Nebbiolo. You were so close to the same region, it's like, nah, let's go Barbera. I would have loved to know the decision making behind like Barbera. Given the decision making of everything, you have to bunch thin or crop thin. Uh, you can postpone the bottling process if you want to do a secondary ferment or malolactic. Uh, you can buy an old tractor to speed up the harvest, uh, finishing in two turns instead of three, but that tractor will eventually break down. <laughs> so you have to spend time and money on repairing it, which involves playing another card. So they've actually, They've gotten it's got like, some mechanics in it. This, yeah, this is clearly some PTSD winemaker is just like, yeah, I could do this. This is specific. There's a couple of like key um, like personalities in it. There's a nosy neighbor who adores you and effectively does guerrilla marketing in your behalf. Like we've always said, I love what you guys do. Like I'm gonna go and tell everyone about you. Now um, that is spot on. Spot on. <laughs> There's a shadowy syndicate couple who are wary of the newcomer to the region that are like, nope, sorry, but like, you know, we can't really have more of you in here because there's only like a set amount of market that we can sell to. And um, the rugged journalist, uh, they've got their own Katie Spain. Uh, the rugged journalist wanting to tell the stories of winemakers in the region. Uh, that's like just willing to get out there and like write about, you know, all the new players. Have they got a, uh, have they got a tripod hack trio of YouTubers who come on and review their wines <laughs> and talk shit about yeah, them? Because yeah. that's pretty realistic. Well, again, expansion pack ideas. <laughs> you, gotta play, you gotta play the game for 10 vintages and then you start getting to the hardcore yeah. marketing aspects. That's it. There are local wine bars run by others who have just recently moved to the area, appreciative for the, for the efforts of playing uh, as another outsider. Wow. Uh, your trusty workers, and they range from the very chill tutorial farmhand. Yeah, bro, like we're in Margaret River, man. Did we just go with the seasons of the ocean? Uh, <laughs> Can we pick tomorrow? It swells we, up. Yeah, it swells up. It's like, <laughs> oh, a, it's like a fruit day, man. Uh, to, <laughs> to a vineyard specialist that looks and talks like he has an Instagram account for wellness pics and motivational quotes. Seriously, this journalist, mate, I... I, I, I Get in touch and we'll send you a bottle of Unico, uh, seriously. The yeah, upgrades too can be a bit clumsy. It costs money to unlock everything, new tractors, new grapes, to plants on new vines, new pruning techniques, barrels, but you actually have to pay twice for those upgrades. So the problem is that 100 days isn't clear about the full cost of an upgrade to commit. For instance, if I want to upgrade my warehouse with the shop to expand my sales, I don't just have to pay 10,000 euro for the upgrade, I also have to pay 20,000 euros to build the shop itself. Just like real life. Just like real life. This is where the game starts to topple over and being maybe a little bit too real as a simulator. It's painful. What I want is I want the expansion pack that is the casual employee working at a boutique winery in the hills. Because I'm not going to lie, ever since I've started working for you guys, life's absolutely fantastic. It sounds like you've got a whole pile of stressful <laughs> stuff, but like imagine a simulation where you get to come in, have a few wines and talk shit to a camera once a week. Oh, well, I- <laughs> That's the NPC. You're an NPC. <laughs> you're, an, you're, an, you're the chill farm hand, man. Yeah. Right. Get this. I don't know about tomorrow, man. It's pretty hot out there. I don't think we should pick. Just leave another down skin contact. I don't understand wine making. To, all the buildings have their own Tetris style grid. So it's like an isometric style design. So if you don't have room to build something, you have to sell something or move it just like real life. Like I would love to be able to just go, oh, look, we've got an upgrade here, but we can just like overlay it onto some kind of, you know, part of the winery. It's like, yeah, no, you need to consider like when you build something, you need to, if you need to upgrade it, you typically will need to tear it down or move it. And that costs even more money. So it's incredibly realistic, like incredibly, incredibly realistic. And they said it's greatly enjoyed with an actual glass of wine. Most yeah. things are. Uh. I would like to see this. Uh, I so reckon we should play. Let's this do a game. let's play. Broken Arms Games. Broken Arms Games. Uh, Broken Arms Games. Um, I would love to know. I've not played this yet, and I'm definitely gonna uh, give this a crack. I would love this to be like a um, like a Twitch style. Do a live stream of us playing that. Or even just oh, get, getting in touch with other Soms oh, yeah. and other winemakers to be like, hey, bro, you know. Like we got Michael Downer, Murdoch Hill. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you yeah. think your Chardonnay game is off the hook? Let's do Barbera, baby. Yeah. 
I'm um, keen. Talk to Michael Corbett from Vanguard, who's done the most vintages you can possibly do in a year. I was like, how accurate is this? Yeah. <laughs> if we, yeah what if, very what if, cool. What if the three of us had a competition to determine who's going to be the head uh, of the winery for next vintage? Well, we do have the <laughs> Funkworks projects. So the winner, maybe the winner gets Guess to make a Funkworks wine. Oh, my God. Excuse me. <laughs> Finally, something I want to win. <laughs> it's a, it's a, that's that's going to be an interesting. You know, the odds are odds are live, and now they are uh, completely official. Now we've said it, and it's been uploaded online. Um, guys, thank you very much for chiming in for this brief little segment of Global Wine News. We'll be back next week with a little bit more. As always, smash the like button and bell notifications, bell icon for notifications. See you in a week. Gotcha.